Good morning, church family. Do you guys miss Pastor Adrian yet? I do. I miss him. <laughs> but uh, just spoke to him just a few moments ago, actually FaceTimed him, and he looked like he was in the great outdoors with his family walking and enjoying the sunshine, so that's, that's great. I don't know where he was, but he was, he was helping me in a moment of crisis. I uh, had a technical problem. I had to give him, a, give him a call. I'm really thankful for him this morning. But uh, it is a privilege to be able to come and worship with each of you this morning, to be in God's house. It's been, a, it's been an exciting week. Um, this week up at WAX at Fangare Adventist Christian School, we had an agape feast on Wednesday night, and it was really neat. Um, I don't know the exact number, but the, the table was full, and they had Anna and, uh, and Wiley had decorated the place and the teachers beautifully, um, and it was a privilege. I got to, to uh, get up and to share a simple gospel message with all the parents and the children. Um, these people are coming from different backgrounds and walks, and some of them may be even here right now. But it's just a privilege uh, to see God working amongst our young people up at WAX and in their homes and families. And um, I, uh, I love that aspect of my job, being able to go up there. Kids, they're so real, you know? They see right through you, and they're happy to, uh, <laughs> like... Uh, it was really neat that I got one of their shirts because I wanted to look like them too. And I put it on. One of the kids comes up to me and just stares at me for a few moments. And they say, you look good in blue. So, oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> you know, they just, they're happy to, to share their opinion with you and, uh, and carry on. And uh, it's just a privilege to be able to, to hang out with them. This morning, we're going to be studying a passage of Scripture found in Matthew, and just as we dive into this topic um, of discussing God's vineyard, that I just want to offer up one more word of prayer. So if you just bear with me, take a moment, we're going to bow our heads for one more time. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we've come to seek a blessing from you. We've come as friends, as family, to worship you, but we're needing to hear from you. And I pray as we open the word that you will speak to us. And I pray, Father, that you will cleanse me of my sin, that I may be a clear channel that you can just speak through me, and Lord, that our hearts may be open to hear what we need to hear, and that our, you will close our ears for the things that maybe we shouldn't hear. So just come... And just use this time we ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 21. Jesus is telling a parable here, which is a story that's teaching a greater purpose or principle. Matthew chapter 21, and it's found in verse 33. Matthew 21 and verse 33. The Bible reads, Hear another parable. This is Jesus speaking. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge around it, and he dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. This landowner is represented by God. And the, the vineyard that was to grow and to produce fruit was representing Israel. And it's interesting that the Pharisees, in particular, the religious leaders, they realized that Jesus was speaking to them specifically through this parable. And God had given them every opportunity and every possibility to grow and to prosper and to produce fruit of character. It says in this parable that he... You know, he planted a vineyard. He put a hedge around it. That hedge may be a, a good and fit example of the law of God. That if you have a vineyard, you want to set a boundary fence so that 
you know, to keep the enemies out and to keep the animals out, but to also keep you in and so forth and to keep you on the straight and narrow. So he'd put a hedge around it, he made a wine press in it, and he built a tower. He'd given every opportunity so that this vineyard would produce fruit of character and it was to be shared with the world and the surrounding nations around them. Jesus carries on. Now, when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers, they took his servants and they beat one and they killed one and they stoned another. And this is simply recounting history. And I think the Jews, they recognized this and the children of Israel, they did. That God had sent prophets and messengers time after time to preach encouragement, restoration, that the children of Israel would fall into one ditch or the other. They would step outside of the hedge of the vineyard, worshiping false idols and false gods, breaking the Sabbath and lying and cheating, and they would just fall into sin. And God had sent messengers time and time again to call them back, to call them back to, to walking and to living and to be producing fruit in his vineyard. And they didn't receive these messengers very well. They beat them, they killed them, they stoned them, they threw them into prison. I'm thinking of Jeremiah and so on. And verse 36, And again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. And I love this, that we see again the heart of God in this story. That God had spoken gently and kindly and loudly through his prophets and his servants time and time again, and they continue to stop their ears, they plug their ears. But if you quickly turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13... And we're going to come back here, so keep a finger there. Oh, my bad. So, uh, 1 Corinthians. We're wanting 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 13. And the Bible tells us that God is love. And this is identifying and speaking of God's character that can be reproduced in you. And it says here in 1 Corinthians 13, well, verse 4, it says, Love suffers, all, suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked and it thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and it endures all things. And I think of this in the context of this parable, that God, he believed all things, he hoped, he endured all things to make sure the message was clear, that was, it was got through to his children. So he sent messengers, he sent prophets to try and awaken and to try and arouse their conscience to come back to him. And finally in the parable, we'll go back to Matthew 21. Love knows no end. And it says that in verse 37, then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. The text, John 3, 16 comes to mind. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That he sent his son, and surely if he sends his son, they will respect my son. Verse 38, but when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. This is a foreshadowing of what was to take place, wasn't it? Therefore, Jesus says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And the people respond, the religious leaders, they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably, men, men miserably, and 
lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of their season. This was a parable that was being lived out in the days of the children of Israel, in the time of Christ. Jesus was speaking in terms, and they become to recognize that they were actually speaking to themselves. He was speaking to themselves. God had done everything possible for Israel to prosper, that their nation was not only to just be where it was placed, but it was to expand its borders it was to encompass the whole world. That was God's plan, that his message was to be carried throughout these people. But they began to get, how could I say, they were stuck in the hedge, right? The hedge that was around the vineyard, their laws and their precepts, that God had designed to draw them and to identify their sin, but it was to draw them closer to God and to help them better explain God's love to the people around them. In Psalms chapter 19 and verse 7, notice what the Bible says about God's law. Psalms chapter 19 and verse 7. Psalms 19, verse 7, the psalmist writes, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God had given Israel this hedge, and it was to convert their hearts. But think of it like this. Maybe after this message, you're come to shake up, shake my hand, or shake me, I don't know what you're going to do, but maybe you're going to shake my hand, or (laughs) hopefully, and you notice that I say, hello to you, and you think, oh, you have bad breath, and you think, I'm going to help this poor guy, I'm going to help him, and I'm going to buy him a toothbrush, and I think, I'm so happy, because next Sabbath you come you say, here's your toothbrush. This is going to help solve the stench in your life. And I'm thinking, wow, this is so cool. It's, it's, a, it's a Colgate toothbrush. It's, you know, it's green. That's the kind. I like green toothbrushes for some reason. But next week you come, and in the following week, and you're thinking, wow, I want to see the effect of the toothbrush in this man's life. And again, my teeth are just covered in plaque like almost gag worthy you're like oh what what did you not use the toothbrush oh yes i'm using it Whew. don't breathe on me <laughs> you say i'm using it but i took that toothbrush home you should come see come look in my home and i've mounted it on the wall aren't you proud i'm so proud of my toothbrush And this was kind of the mentality of the children of Israel, that God had given his laws and his precepts that were to guide them, to instruct them in righteousness and to improve their life. But they took the toothbrush and they held it up on a pedestal there thinking, ah, we're pretty special because we have this toothbrush. And rather than reaching out and sharing the good news about brushing your teeth, they held it to themselves, and they mounted their toothbrushes up on the wall, and their their breath was just as stinky as always. So God sent his messengers to wake them up. And that didn't work. And so often the children of Israel, they would fell captive to their sin, which led into captivity to the nations around them. The Assyrians... The Philistines, the Babylonians, they captured them. And I like to think of it almost as if a timeout, that in these moments of hardship and captivity, they searched their hearts, they cried out to God, they recognized their mistake, and it was, God, we forgot to use our toothbrushes and we're sorry. And they're released from captivity. And they go home and they think, man... That was unpleasant. So we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen again. 
And so in the ancient Hebrew texts, they would it said that there's over 600 laws to help guide them down the straight and narrow, to make sure that they kept their law, to make sure that they weren't caught out, that God wouldn't punish them again for making a mistake, for sinning. So their theology and their understanding of God became very reactive, that, oh, I don't want to do that, so God, I'm sorry, help me not to do that again, and whew, we definitely don't want to do that because it's going to be painful. We're going to be captured and tortured and hurt, and it's going to be painful. We wouldn't want that to happen again. And so they began to serve, you may say, God, and had God of this, this picture of God as being a, a judgmental, a fearful dictator, one to be feared and to be scared of, because if you mess up, zzz, you're out, right? And so Christ was sent to clear up the, mis, the skewed ideas and perspectives of what God was like. There's a psychologist that had, has developed in the last 20 years um, a, a sequence of moral development that takes place from when you're an infant to in adulthood. Now, some people, they get stuck in this sequence of which usually begins, and this is how it starts when we raise our children, right? That you say to your child, hey, uh, don't touch the hot stove. And they're like, oh, you know, and they listen for a short while. But you see them reaching out, and you say, don't touch the hot stove. And because you love your child, you may use some sort of form of discipline to encourage them not to touch the hot stove. Now, are you being mean in doing this? Is that mean? No, of course not. And so you, you begin to bargain and to make deals with your children and, and encouraging them, raising them, to instructing them in righteousness, to do the right thing. You make these deals with them, and it, it goes into various scenes and scenarios. But eventually, your child grows up to a point, and they begin to recognize, and they begin to get a little bit of a, a handle on life, and they begin to recognize the designs and the purposes that, wait, wait a second, the laws that mom and dad had given me, whoa, touching, they were actually trying to preserve me from burning my hand, right? And so they begin to receive that and think, oh, of course, of course I don't want to touch it. In my foolishness of my infancy and childhood, I wanted to do that, but they prevented me, they, they guided me and nurtured me, they made deals with me, they said, oh, if you don't do that, or if you do do this, we'll reward you, right? But finally, they mature, and they begin to grow, and they begin to get a handle on life, and they begin to recognize the law, and you might say that that law and that understanding becomes a part of them, that of course they're not going to run out into the middle of the street, why? Because they figured out, you know, the laws of, uh, of, of, of moving things. I forget what they're called, but you know what I'm talking about in physics. That things can't stop immediately, and that if I jump out in front of that moving bus, I'm going to be the one that continues moving while that bus stays still, and I'll die. <laughs> so they begin to get a handle on life and to recognize these things. So it is in our spiritual development. I like to call this stage the donut shop. And listen to me, just follow me here. Now, I'm not talking about New Zealand donuts, okay? See, in New Zealand, I've been instructed, well, I was asking the young people this morning, what's a donut? They said, oh, it's a piece of dough that's fried and it's sweet. I said, no, 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 I'm thinking to myself, they've got it all wrong. I've gone into some donut shops in New Zealand, and donuts are usually hot dog buns full of cream, and I don't think that's a donut, or they are a little piece of freeze of fried bread and, and whatever. But if you go to Canada, you can go to Tim Hortons. Now, bear with me. In Tim Hortons, whatever sickening, sweet fantasy you have, it is there. Okay? You can buy honey glazed, you can buy sugar coated, you can buy chocolate glazed. And everybody's paying attention right now for some reason. <laughs> You can buy jelly-filled, cream-filled. You can buy, my favorite, the Canadian maple that tastes like maple syrup slightly. It's got a beautiful, creamy taste. You can buy all of these things. Now, it is not good to go to the donut shop every day, right? 
But it may be necessary when you are on a long trip to stop maybe once, maybe twice, right? To, to do so if you're traveling a long distance. And you go in there and you, you, you start selecting all the donuts uh, that, that you would like to have. Now, hopefully you only pick one and you'll move on and that's it. But the reason why I call this stage of living is that in, as Christians, we like to make a checklist for God. That God has given us his law, and to be sure that we are not caught out and punished because we have broken his law, we make a checklist. And this is the donut shop. That we like to say, yes, I'll take a little bit of do not lie, and I'll I'll have a, a do not steal, and I'll have some do not commit adultery, and do not, and we might even get into those really tasty ones like don't smoke and do not drink and those ones too. And we, we have this beautiful uh, delicacies in our life that we think, God, look at my diet. Look at what I'm eating. Look at all the things that I'm doing and not doing. And the Bible says that when God looks upon our righteousness, it's like what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. And actually, if we live in this state of this is our diet that God must, haha, you can't catch me out because I'm doing and or not doing all the right or wrong things, then God, you must look upon me with favor. But God, the, as like I said, that it may be necessary in the early steps of your journey to stop at a donut shop. To understand these principles, maybe the do's and the don'ts, God's law, that hedge that was to surround Israel, it was to serve a purpose. His laws and his precepts were to actually draw them to God, but instead they mounted them on the wall and they said, aha, look at us, look at our beautiful hedge, right? But God wants to carry us forward and further that as we come closer to Christ, we become to learn a little bit about the designs that God has made in our life and how he has made us and what he has made us to be, that this lifestyle, it is very self-centered Christianity, if you understand. It's all focusing on the do's and the don'ts and that you sure can recognize when someone else has forgot to eat their do not lie when they tell a lie or they forgot to eat in their Do not steal or whatever. You're quick to recognize that in others. And by the way, that when you're living in this lifestyle, the do's and the don'ts, and that's all you're thinking about, we become very critical of other people. And it's actually, I find it fascinating that in this passage, that Jesus asks the people that were listening to this, what should be done to these people that are living in this this way, where he sent messengers and they, they tried to reform in their own ways, what should be done to them? And it said there in Matthew 21, in verse 41, it says, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers. Now, if you go back to, with me to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says something very interesting here. Matthew 7 and verse 1, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you, measure, measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, the critical eye and the judgmental glares and glances that, are, that you view at other people, that comes back on your own head. And so it was in this living parable that was taking place here with Jesus that these people are saying, hey, they should be destroyed and that vineyard should be given to someone else so that they can produce righteous fruit in it. It was. It was taken away from the children of Israel. And it was given to everyone else, the Gentiles, to anyone who might believe that God can now live through you and produce his righteous fruit, his righteous character in you, and so his message of grace and salvation can be spread throughout the whole world through you. It's awesome. So God is calling us to move out of these do's and don'ts where as we allow Christ to dwell in us, we begin to recognize that, wait a second, rather than doing this because I'm scared of what might happen to me, I will keep his law because 
Actually, it's because I love him. Because I love him that I don't want to lie. And when you're in the context of maybe your business or you're at home with your spouse, that maybe you get into an argument with your spouse and you blow it and you start losing your cool. Or with your children. The Holy Spirit can tap you on the shoulder and and remind you that this is not Christ's heart. You're reverting back to your old way of thinking. You're recognizing the do's and the don'ts and you're becoming quite critical and so on. That you can pray that God can put his love back in your heart. And you can say, honey, I'm sorry. I messed up. Kids, I'm sorry. And you can work out a deal of how you can improve things in your home and so forth. So we begin to have a handle on life, and we move from being this self-centered Christianity to it's an others-centered Christianity. It's not about my opinions and views being held. It's about making sure that whatever I say and whatever I do, that the main message is that I care and that God loves them, right? We move away from making deals to loving unconditionally. I don't know why I make these notes. I always do it all backwards, but they're here. Okay, that's good. We're getting close to the end, guys. Hang in there. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I have found myself in at times in this critical state of thinking where I've, I can become judgmental of my own mistakes and character and I can see the faults in others. And especially in myself, when I make a mistake, I may see God and I say, God, I'm sorry. I messed up. God, give me victory over this. And he forgives me. I know he does. But then it seems that I will make that mistake again. And I see God and I go back through that work of repentance and I say, God, I'm sorry, can you forgive me? God is wanting to move us out of this do's and don'ts into writing his law on our hearts so that it's not something that we're seeking, continually asking for forgiveness over, but it becomes who we are. And so rather than uh, I'm beginning to change my structure of my prayer, that when I recognize that I've made a mistake, that the prayer of my heart is, God, my teeth, they're dirty. They stink. My breath is bad. But this is an indication that I have a greater need, and it's my heart. I need a new heart. I need this stony heart to be taken out and I need a transplant. I need to stop living in the donut shop and I need to move into God's one-stop shop, his heart shop, right? Where he can put me on the correct diet that seeks to understand and to reveal God's love. That that's my focus, not the do's and the don'ts, those will come naturally because I'm secure in the love of my Heavenly Father. You know, thankfully in New Zealand, child brides are not allowable, are they? Are they? No, of course not. Now, in some countries, they are. That you can uh, sign up for a child bride if you so wish. And does that child bride love their husband? No, they don't. Will they live with their husband? Yeah. What will be their motivating uh, mentality to honor and respect their husband? It's usually fear, isn't it? They will serve their husband in fear. The Bible tells us that Our Heavenly Father is coming to claim His bride, right? And He's not coming back for a child bride that serves God out of fear because of fear of what He might do to us or how He might receive us or how He would view us. 
but he's coming back for his bride that is secure, that is secure in his love, and that when mistakes are made, they run to their husband and they make things right. Because God has planted his law in their heart. And so, yes, the tone of my prayer, it is moving away from God. Rather than helping me overcome this, God, please give me a new heart. I need you to live within me so that these expressions, these indicators that I see coming out in my life, they may they reflect the fruit of the Spirit. In one of my classes, um, it's interesting that I go to school and I listen on the computer. I can have no say, but I can listen. And some of well, a fellow classmate, um, I do it through correspondence, a story came out in one of my classes recently of this young man who who his parents, after he had grown up and moved out of home, uh, they adopted a young child. Um, It was a foster child. They brought it into their home, and it was a a powerful and important ministry. And if you have the the, the ability to do so, I think it's great. Um, This child had come into their home, and they noticed some weird habits in this young child's life that... Uh, from time to time, this weird smell would start coming out of the room of this, this little kid. And the mom would go in there and start digging around, and they would find a pile of rotting food under the bed. Like, what's going on? And what had taken place, and this would happen from time and time again, that, that the child was scared that this may be their last meal. And so it would take food from the table and go and hide it under their bed just in case they might get hungry again, which reflects their previous life, doesn't it, right? The hardship that they had gone through. And I think to myself that how easy it is, it is for us when mistakes are made, when harsh words are thrown, that it's easy for us to revert back to our old way of thinking. We like to call people out when a mistake is made, and there is a point and there's a purpose for that, that we need to come forward. And you'd be, you'd be interested to see that, that those that are living in this state of the do's and the don'ts and those that are living in the freedom of God, that His love, His heart has been planted in them, both are keeping the commandments. But it comes from a different motive, from fear from love. And I just, it's the burden on my heart this morning for my life, and I hope it for yours as well, that we will stop reverting back to our old way of thinking, of being critical maybe of others, critical of ourselves and abusing ourselves when mistakes are made and thinking that we need to come on some probationary terms before we come back to God. But no, come back to our loving Heavenly Father at the first stage inkling of sin in your life and know that he welcomes you like that prodigal son know that he welcomes you he saw him from afar off the bible says and with arms open he came and welcomed him home so my prayer this morning is that god will plant his heart in us and that our life will be a living expression of his heart let's pray our heavenly father Lord, a lot has been said this morning, but we pray that your name has been lifted up. And we're grateful that you are a loving God that sees us in all of our failures and in all of our mistakes and all of our critical thinking towards others. And that doesn't detest you, that doesn't put you off, but it actually drives you to us. So Father, we want to open our hearts to you this morning. Please take our stony heart away that's caught up in tradition or formalism or serving you out of fear. And I pray that you may plant in each of our hearts today a new heart that seeks to love, that seeks to put others first, and seeks to put your name and to lift your name up. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
In closing, we're going to sing our song face-to-face, number 206.